Welcome back. This time moving on to biomechanics. This chapter, uh, chapter two, is basically biomechanics light. So it is a review of a lot of the things that you did in PE Prof 302, but without the math. So uh, some of this we talked about last time or, or with chapter one. So in terms of skeletal musculature and, and the structure of that musculature, so you're familiar with the terminology, the origin, the insertion, and then action. Um, so the origin of a muscle is where it starts, the insertion is where it stops, and typically the origin is located proximally, so close to the body, and the insertion is located distally, so far from the body. So for example with biceps brachii, aka your biceps, so remember the biceps has two origins, there's one uh, on the coracoid process and the other is on the supraglenoid tubercle, so just above uh, the socket for your shoulder. Those two heads run together, so those um, that origin or those origins are proximal, they're close to the body uh, because they start there on the scapula, both of them. And then those two origins run together, form a common belly and then a common tendon of insertion into the tuberosity of the radius. And so that tuberosity of the radius is distal, it's farther from the body than the scapula is. And so the origin or origins in that case, the two close um, areas where the muscle starts and then the insertion, the one distal or far away part where the muscle stops. And of course, then whenever the muscle engages in its action, it pulls the insertion toward the origin under most circumstances. Um, and again, as, as we talked about last time, if the muscle is on the trunk, typically the origin is superior, so closer to the head, and then the insertion is inferior or farther from the head. Um, and then I mentioned there that the muscle's insertion typically gets pulled toward the origin. You know, from a practical stand or practical sense, that doesn't always happen. So the classic example is, you know, if you do a bicep curl, then that's just straight elbow flexion. And when you do that, you're going to pull the muscles insertion toward the origin. So you're going to pull the radius toward the scapula in that case. But if we change the muscle action a little bit, or not muscle action, but if we change the exercise, um, if we have the athlete doing something like a pull up. Well, now the forearm and hand are stabilized, and then the rest of the body is going to be moving. So in that case, we actually pull the origin toward the insertion. So you get a, a reverse action in that case. There's some other terminology on there that we touched on briefly in 201. So if we talk about a muscle as an agonist, another way of thinking about that is that that muscle is the prime mover. Its action is doing whatever the person is, or its action is causing whatever the person is doing. So for example, if we flex the elbow, which means to bend your arm, then biceps brachii is an agonist for that motion. It's a prime mover for that motion. It's not the only one, but it is one of the prime movers for that motion. An antagonist, so think about the antagonist in the context of all those English classes you've taken. So the antagonist in a story is the bad guy in the story. In the case of muscles, the antagonist does the opposite of what the agonist does. So sticking with the example of elbow flexion or bending the arm, if the agonist is biceps, it's going to cause elbow flexion. The antagonist is a muscle that does the opposite. So the opposite of elbow flexion is elbow extension, and the primary elbow extensor is triceps brachii. So in the case of elbow flexion, triceps brachii is an antagonist for elbow flexion. So it does the opposite of elbow flexion. So the antagonists resist those motions or they do the opposite of. So oftentimes where antagonists come into play is that they are going to be involved in stopping a motion or slowing it down. So for example, uh, with something like a throw, after you release, let's use my classic example of a baseball pitch, after you release the ball, the arm or the shoulder more specifically is going to be going into internal rotation. And so what you're going to get then is a contraction of the external rotators, the antagonist, trying to slow the arm's motion or slow the humerus's motion into internal rotation, They're trying to slow it down and stop that motion. They're putting on the brakes. Synergists are muscles that are assisters. And typically when we talk about synergists, we talk about them in the context of being stabilizers. So for example, if I'm going to um, engage in glenohumeral flexion, so if I lift my arm straight out toward the front, in order to do that uh, and to get the motion that I want, I have to stabilize the scapula. So the scapular stabilizers in that case would be synergists. So muscles like serratus anterior, the rhomboids, traps, etc. So those are all your synergists. Um, for most motions, um, yeah, almost all really, um, you're going to have to get 
some stabilization of the spine, so muscles like multifidi or multifidus, uh, multifidi is plural, um, but you could engage the multifidi, which are spine stabilizers, um, before you move your arm or before you move your leg, for example. So um, those types of stabilizers are consistent synergists um, pretty much regardless of what the action is that we're doing. So synergists are assisters and stabilizers. All right, so let's talk about levers. So as you can see there, a lever is a rigid body that, when subjected to a force whose line of action does not pass through its pivot point, it exerts force on any object impeding its tendency to rotate. So key term or key point there is that the lever is a rigid body and that in order to create a lever rather than just having a rigid body, we have to have a point of rotation which is referred to either as the fulcrum or as the axis. And so that's the pivot point of the lever. So here's my, here's a classic lever setup, right? So we've got our fulcrum or axis here. You've got your rigid body here. And so um, there are two arms to that or two or what are referred to arms to that. So the axis uh, or the fulcrum here is kind of the middle and it separates the, um, again, what I'll call arms. So you've got the force or resistance arm, which runs from the axis to whatever the weight is that I'm lifting. Um, and then, let me back up a little bit, actually, so let's switch that. So that's, sorry, that's the resistance arm. Um, so this is the resistance arm here, um, the distance from the axis to whatever weight I'm lifting. And then the force or the effort arm is over here, which is where I'm applying muscular force, or in this case, that would still be muscular force. I'm pressing down on this lever, trying to lift up this, let's call that a boulder, right? Um, so why would we talk about levers in a strength and conditioning class? The reason for that, is, or the primary reason for that, is because your bones rotating around each other form levers, right? So the bones are rigid bodies, um, and the bones interact with each other. So again, thinking about the elbow, so the primary joint of the elbow, the humeral ulna joint, so um, the ulna, whenever we flex the elbow, is actually going to rotate around the humerus. Um, and so the ulna then is the rigid body. The forces that the muscles produce, so again, we'll stick with biceps brachii, because biceps brachii is going to insert um, into the radius, but the radius and the ulna act together in this case. Um, and so the action of biceps brachii is off-center. So it's not going to run through the axis, but the action of biceps brachii is actually a little bit off-center here. And so when it starts to pull on that lever, that's going to produce a rotary force. Or when it starts to pull on the bone, that's going to produce a rotary force. And so then the bone uh, rotating around another bone acts as a lever. Another term is the moment arm. So as you can see there, that's the definition for the moment arm, the perpendicular distance from the line of action to the force of the fulcrum, which is an interesting definition. Um, but it, so the key part that I want you to know, perpendicular distance um, from, and I'm going to reword this, but perpendicular distance from the resistance to the axis of rotation. So for example here, again, elbow flexion. So you've got your humerus here, got your ulna here, and then radius over here. And let's say we're lifting a small dumbbell, like a five or 10 pound dumbbell, right? So it, it, because of its mass, is going to be acted upon by gravity. And so gravity is going to pull down on it here. And so the effort arm, or sorry, the moment arm, moment arm is, uh, we'll get to effort arm in a second. The moment arm is the perpendicular distance, so the 90 degree angle distance between that weight and the axis of rotation. In this example, because the forearm is being held at 90 degrees, the moment arm is the same length as the forearm and part of the hand in this case. But that's of course going to change because we're going to move the weight up or down um, through the range of motion of a bicep curl. So for example, I know the shape of my weight changed because this is a diagram from a different book, but the, the concept here is what I want to show you, which is that as you flex the elbow, so as it moves um, past 90 degrees of elbow flexion, the weight itself, that perpendicular distance, so again, that 90 degree angle distance here is going to be shorter. So the moment arm is shorter in this case. And so with something like a bicep curl, when you are, oops, back it up a little bit, when you are in this position, in the middle of the biceps curl, that is when the moment arm of the weight, 
is the longest. So that's when, it's, that's when the weight itself is the farthest from the axis of rotation in terms of 90 degree distance. So it's, its moment arm is the longest. If you move your arm up or move farther into elbow flexion as we do here, that's gonna shorten the moment arm, moves it closer to the axis of rotation in terms of 90 degree distance. And the same thing happens if we uh, let the weight drop below 90 degrees of elbow flexion. The weight is gonna move closer to the axis of rotation um, at least from a perpendicular distance standpoint. So I don't have a diagram of that, but you can probably envision it pretty well. So that's the moment arm. Torque, um, probably the easiest way to, to conceptualize torque is a turning force. Um, that's the way I always thought about it. But the technical definition there, uh, the degree to which a force tends to rotate an object about a specified fulcrum. So again, a rotary force. The um, basic equation for torque is the amount of force that the object exerts times its distance from the axis of rotation. So the farther, well, let me, let me put some numbers to this. So if you have your five pound dumbbell, and I won't back up because then my torque definition goes away, but try to envision that picture from a second ago, this one. All right, so we're using, we're envisioning this. I know my torque definition went away, but we're using this. Um, so we've got our, our five pound dumbbell here. All right, so there, at that uh, distance from the axis of rotation, it's going to be reasonably heavy to move. Well, what happens if we move that weight closer here? Let's pretend instead of a, an actual dumbbell, it's something like a, um, one of those weighted cuffs, like an ankle weight, where you can, can attach it to your leg with Velcro. Let's pretend we're moving one of those that weighs five pounds. So if we have that weight out here, its torque is going to be the amount of weight, so five pounds, times the distance from the axis of rotation, right? And so maybe, I don't know, my forearms give or take 13 inches, I don't know. I should have probably measured it before I gave this talk. But let's pretend that my forearm is 13 inches. So the torque exerted by, or the turning force exerted by this weight is gonna be that five pounds times the distance from the axis of rotation, so 13. And then if we move it in a little bit here, let's say we reduce that distance to eight inches from the axis of rotation, still weighs five pounds, but now it's closer to the axis of rotation. So five times eight, 40, is smaller than five times 13. You do the math. Um, and so because of that, the torque or the turning force exerted by that weight as we move it closer to the axis of rotation is lower. So why that matters from a practical standpoint is that I can use the same weight or the same resistance to make an exercise harder or easier. So for example, if you think about if you're doing something like hip rehab, so one of the common uh, types of hip rehab exercises is you have somebody side lying uh, and their, their legs are gonna be straight, stacked on top of each other, and they're just gonna abduct their hip against gravity. So they're just gonna pick their leg up. Well, if they're fairly strong at that, we may need to add some resistance. So we might put an ankle weight on them and we might, we might actually put it down by their ankle. But maybe I only have a five pound weight and that five pound weight is too much down by their ankle. So you might think, well, it's either five pounds or nothing because I don't have any other weights. But what you could do is take advantage of this concept, this idea of torque here, and you could actually move the weight closer to the axis of rotation. So maybe you attach the weight just proximal to their knee. And in doing that, you have kept the weight constant, obviously, so the force stays constant, but its distance from the axis of rotation has been reduced, so the torque produced by the weight is lower, so it takes less tension developed by the muscle in order to overcome that resistance. And so that's one of the ways that you can use um, the same weight to make things either harder or easier, um, or to, yeah, to make an exercise more difficult or not. We see the same concept um, if you're doing like ab exercises, sometimes you'll see people do um, sit-ups. And so one of the things that you can do to make it a little bit harder is to um, put your arms across your chest. And then if that's pretty easy, then you can put your arms behind your head. And so if you put your, put your hands behind your head, you're moving more mass farther from the axis of rotation. So you're increasing the torque there, uh, the turning force, the resistance. And then uh, you can do the same kind of thing. You can hold the weight on your chest, you can hold the weight behind your head. And then if you're really strong, and have good shoulder range of motion, you can hold the weight fully extended straight overhead and do the exercise that way, right? And so you can do all of that with you know, a five or 10 pound weight, but you can manipulate its distance from the axis of rotation to uh, reduce or increase the amount of torque exerted by the weight and make the exercise either easier or harder. All right, mechanical advantage. 
So the mechanical advantage is the ratio of the moment arm through which an applied force acts to that through which the resistive force acts. It is basically the ratio of the effort, the force arm or the effort arm, so you're going to see both terms, but they mean the same thing. It's the ratio of the length of the force arm or the effort arm to the length of the resistance arm. So if it's greater than 1, so if mechanical advantage is greater than 1, that means that the, the length of the force arm is greater than the length of the resistance arm. And so as a consequence, the person can apply less muscle force uh, than the resistive force to, pro uh, to produce an equal amount of torque or turning force. If the mechanical advantage is less than 1, it means that the person has to apply a greater muscle force than the amount of resistive force present and it creates a disadvantage for the muscle. So from a practical standpoint, what that means then is if the mechanical advantage is greater than one, it means that the force arm is longer than the resistance arm. And I'll show you what that looks like here in a second in, the, um, in a drawing of a second class lever. But basically what that means is if the force arm is longer than the resistance arm, it's easier to lift something. And if we reverse that, if the resistance arm is longer than the force arm, it's gonna be harder to lift something. So, I think that'll become more clear as we go along here and we talk about different lever classes. So let's do that now. So there are three classes of levers. So first, second, third. So this is what a first class lever looks like. And you probably, I'm sure you covered this in biomechanics, because um, this is actually from an old biomechanics book I used to use when I taught that class. Um, so the three components of our lever here. So the A is the axis of rotation or the fulcrum. And then the E is the effort arm. So that is the um, part of the lever through which the muscles are acting. And then the R is the resistance arm. So that is the weight that I'm, that I'm lifting. And so that's why I have my little box here. So in the case of a first class lever, you have the effort arm on one side, the axis in the middle, and then the resistance arm on the other side. So the effort arm and the resistance arm in a first class lever are separated by the axis of rotation or the fulcrum. Now, you can change the length of these you know, if we're doing something like moving a rock, um, we can change the length of these. So from a mechanical advantage standpoint, the thing I just talked about on the last slide, what I wanna do is to shorten the resistance arm as much as possible. So I wanna move the weight as close to the, axis, close to the axis of rotation as possible because tying this back to torque, the weight's always gonna be the same. So if the boulder weighs 50 pounds, it's always gonna weigh 50 pounds. But if it's closer to the axis of rotation, the amount of torque that it exerts is lower. So it's going to be easier to overcome that resistance. And then I'm going to lengthen the effort arm. So I'm going to have a really long stick on this side and then a relatively short stick or relatively short resistance arm on this side. And then that will give me a greater mechanical advantage because the effort arm is longer than the resistance arm. So the mechanical advantage is going to be higher than one. And so then it's going to be easier for me to move that rock. From an anatomical standpoint, uh, there aren't a ton of first class levers in the body. Um, you're going to hear this more than once. Most of the levers in the body are third class levers. But one of the few examples of a first class lever in the body is the atlanto occipital joint. So the atlanto occipital joint is the interaction between the occipital bone, the base of your skull, and then the most superior vertebrae, C1, the atlas. And so Remember that at the atlanto-occipital joint, we primarily get a forward and backward sliding. So that's where you say yes in your neck or where we get most of the motion to say yes in the neck. Uh, and so the atlanto-occipital joint is the fulcrum. And then the load is all of the weight of my head in front of that axis. And then the effort arm is the, di the distance between the axis of rotation and then the insertion of the musculature so in this case, the spine extensors, the insertion of the musculature that's going to oppose that load, that's going to lift that load. So that is my effort or force arm over here, is this distance between the axis of rotation between the atlanto-occipital joint and then the insertion of the muscles into the base of the occipital bone. So that's a first class lever. Then second class levers, we change the arrangement of all of those pieces. So in a second class lever, you have the axis of rotation or the fulcrum on one side, the resistance arm in the middle, and then the effort arm on the end. So 
thinking back to the concept of mechanical advantage, because of this arrangement, the resistance arm is always shorter than the effort arm, and so because of that, in the second class lever, the mechanical advantage is always greater than one. The effort arm is always longer than the resistance arm, so second class levers really favor force production. It takes relatively little force to exert a great amount of effort and to do, um, I won't say work because we're going to get to that in a second, but it takes relatively little force um, to overcome the resistance is probably the best way to say that. So in terms of where you might see second class levers, so classic example, wheelbarrow. Uh, wheelbarrows make things pretty easy to lift, or relatively easy to lift, because you've got your axis of rotation here with the wheel. Then you have your resistance arm, where you're going to put your rocks or dirt or whatever you're lifting. And then you have your effort arm over here, which is the handles where you pick it up. Right? So the effort arm is this long. The resistance arm is this long. Similarly, you see it in a nutcracker. So you may not be able to produce enough force to crack the shell of a nut you know, between your thumb and index finger. But if we add this tool and we increase the length of the effort arm, then we can increase our mechanical advantage and we can overcome the resistance, in this case, the shell. From a musculoskeletal standpoint, classic example of second class lever, I think every textbook uses this example, is the ankle. Um, and so if you're doing something like calf raises, so the axis of rotation is through the metatarsophalangeal joints here. The resistance arm runs from the metatarsophalangeal joints through the center of your tibia, because the weight of the body is going to press down through the center of the tibia, through the talus, on down here. Okay, so that's the force vector of the, the weight of the body. And so then that's the resistance arm. And then the effort arm is the insertion of the um, triceps surae, so gastroc, um, soleus, and then plantaris, the insertion of those muscles into the calcaneus here. So in that case then, the resistance arm is here, okay, so there's our resistance arm, there's our effort arm, so the effort arm is always longer than the resistance arm, so because of that you always have a mechanical advantage, which you um, probably know if you've ever seen anybody do calf raises or if you've ever done them yourself at the gym, you can usually stack all kinds of weight on that thing. You know, you can probably do a couple hundred pounds for, you know, 12 reps or more pretty easily. Um, and that's because of that mechanical advantage that gastroc and soleus and plantaris have uh, in plantar flexing the ankle. So second class levers produce a lot of force. So that's their advantage. Third class levers, you just flip second class. Um, so the axis stays off to one side. So we have our axis of rotation over here, just like we did with the second class lever, except we just flip the effort and the resistance arm. So the effort arm is here. Um, it is, so that's the line of muscle action in this example. And then the resistance arm is here, pressing down. So the resistance arm in a third class lever is always longer than the effort arm. And so the mechanical advantage is less than one. So third class levers, um, have, do not have mechanical advantage. So it um, takes lots of force to overcome the resistance. And again, most of the levers on the body are third class levers because I feel like that's probably one of the, the questions from this type of category that the NSCA might ask about. Um, it's kind of the classic question about um, from a biomechanics standpoint about lever classes. So anyway, most, most of the levers in the body are third class levers. So in terms of anatomy here, so humeral ulnar joint, insertion of biceps, and then we have our dumbbell that we're lifting here. So then the resistance arm runs from the humeral ulnar joint all the way out to where we're holding the dumbbell here. So pretty long resistance arm. And then the effort arm, as you can see, is fairly short. It runs from the uh, axis of rotation, so the humeral ulnar joint, to the insertion of biceps here. So the effort arm in this case is fairly short. Well, why would we do that? Why would we have um, a mechanical disadvantage in most of the levers of the body? And the answer to that is because that allows us greater range of motion and greater speed. So as biceps flexes, it doesn't have to contract too much to produce a really big motion of the hand out here. So the hand is going to cover a pretty big linear distance, and it can cover that linear distance in a relatively short amount of time. So the advantage of third class levers is they favor speed and range of motion. 
that's another one of those questions that, that people typically like to ask about this sort of thing. So third class levers favor speed, or speed and range of motion. Second class levers favor force production. But in favoring force production, they give up some speed and range of motion. Another thing that, that uh, is a fairly common type of question related to levers is what happens if we manipulate the insertion of biceps. So if we move a muscle's insertion. So for example, if we popped off our biceps and we're like, you know what? I want to see how this turns out for me. Doc, when you do the surgery to replace it, don't put it back through the tuberosity of the radius. Instead, slide it down about an inch. So if, if we move the insertion of the biceps distally, now what we've done is we have increased the length of the effort arm, okay? So by doing that, obviously the resistance arm length is going to stay the same because our hand hasn't moved any farther from the axis of rotation. So our forearm is the same length, so the resistance arm is always going to stay the same. But if we slide biceps distally a little bit, what we're going to do then is increase the length of the effort arm, and so we've changed that mechanical advantage. We're still at a mechanical disadvantage because the resistance arm is still longer, but it's not as much longer as it used to be. And so by moving the uh, insertion farther from the axis of rotation, we've increased the length of the effort arm, and we've moved closer to getting a mechanical advantage. So uh, if you did that, you would be stronger in biceps curls. You'd be able to lift more weight. The downside, of course, is that you would lose some range of motion. So you probably wouldn't be able to fully straighten your arm. Uh, so that'd be a, a problem for you. Um, so it's, it's going to change the way the joint functions, of course, but from a purely uh, lever class standpoint or from a purely mechanical advantage standpoint, that would increase your mechanical advantage to move the insertion farther from the axis of rotation. So here's a guy doing um, lateral raises. Lateral raises, again, so I, I left this in here because it's an example, another example of a third class lever because everybody always uses biceps. Um, so in the case of lateral raises, the axis of rotation is the glenohumeral joint. The effort arm is the deltoid, or the distance between the glenohumeral joint and the deltoid tuberosity. And of course, then the resistance arm is the length uh, of your entire arm all the way out to your hand where you're holding the dumbbell in that case. All right, so key points from this stuff. So most of the muscles that move limbs are third class levers, said that several times. Um, they always then operate at a mechanical disadvantage, but they offer greater range of motion and greater speed. Second class levers favor force production because the force arm is always longer than the resistance arm. First class levers are kind of the jack of all trades. They can favor force production if their effort arm is longer than the resistance. Um, or they can favor range of motion if the resistance arm is longer than the effort arm, or they can do balance depending upon the configuration. So if both are the same length, effort arm and, and resistance arm, then first class levers can, can uh, be effective at producing balance. And then my so what that I actually touched on a little bit earlier. So if we move a resistance farther from the axis of rotation, it increases the torque generated by that weight um, in the strength and conditioning sense. Um, and so by doing that, that increases the force required to overcome that resistance. So the farther a force is from the axis of rotation, the more torque it exerts, means it's harder to lift. Um, so as another example, uh, if you want to squat more, <laughs> um, one of the things you'll see powerlifters do is rather than doing a high bar squat where the bar is basically at the, the base of your neck right around C7, you'll see that powerlifters will slide the bar down some and then you have to really um, retract the scapulas a little bit more, but they'll slide the bar down some to where it sits basically along the spines of the scapula, and those couple inches that they move the bar down effectively move the bar closer to the axis of rotation, which in that case runs through the lumbar spine, makes the weight easier to move, or enables them to lift more weight by generating the same amount of muscular force. All right, so I touched on uh, varying the point of tendon insertion. So one of the things you'll see, and hopefully you talked about this in, in um, biomechanics when you took that, but um, when we think about a muscle's line of action, so again, back to biceps here, so its line of action is here. So when it it's, um, inserts into the tuberosity of the radius and contracts, the line through which it actually acts uh, is going to run through the center of the muscle belly toward the origin of the muscle, right? So that here's its, its actual line of action, the long one. But we can break that line of action down into 
two components. We can break it down into the horizontal component of the force and the vertical component of the force. So here, the horizontal component of the force is this one, so that's the stabilizing component. And then the vert vertical component of the force is the rotary component. So from a cliff note standpoint, the thing to know is that the rotary component is the one that actually produces motion. The stabilizing component, or the horizontal component of the force, is actually going to pull the ulna toward the humerus. So it's going to pull those two bones together. And so by doing that, it helps stabilize the joint. So it's not producing any rotation. It's not contributing to range of motion. But what it is doing is contributing to joint stability. So only the vertical aspect of that force contributes to rotation. And then once we get past 90, things shift a little bit. So the horizontal component actually acts slightly as a dislocating force uh, because of the orientation of the origin insertion of biceps and its line of action. That um, horizontal component is actually going to pull the ulna forward or anteriorly a little bit. And so it effectively distracts or pulls the joint apart. So it becomes a dislocating component. But the rotary component, so you can see what they've done here is they've, they've changed places past 90. Um, that's probably more detailed than you need to know for the NSCA. Um, so what you really need to know then is that the vertical component of a force, because again, we can, we can break a force vector, so that's this. We can break a force vector down into its vertical and horizontal components. The vertical component is the one that contributes to rotation. That's what you probably need to know. Uh, the other thing you probably need to know, again, classic example here, almost every book talks about this, <clears throat> is the role of the patella, a.k.a. your kneecap. And so here's somebody who doesn't have a patella, and so you can see the, um, this is actually the resultant vector, uh, the resultant vector here, the, the line of action, is pretty close to the femur and pretty close to the tibia. And so there's not a lot of vertical component to this. But if we throw the patella in here, there's a bigger vertical component. And so what that means then is that increased vertical component increases the rotary power of the quadriceps muscle group. So by pulling the tendon away from the axis of rotation, we've increased the vertical component of the force, and that allows for the quadriceps muscles to create more torque, more turning force with the same amount of muscle tension. So you've got uh, sesamoid bones in several places in the body. So sesamoid bones are bones in a tendon. The patella just happens to be the largest of them. Um, and so its job then is to move the patellar tendon away from the axis of rotation to give the quadriceps group a, a better mechanical advantage. Um, uh, probably don't want to say it like that, but, but to um, help the quadriceps uh, generate a greater turning force for the same amount of muscle tension is probably the most accurate way of saying that. Other places we've got sesamoid bones, you have a couple of them. Most of us do under our big toe. Sometimes people have them in their thumb tendons. Um, but the, the basic idea is the same, to enable that the muscles that are um, in whose tendon those bones are embedded to be able to generate more turning force with the same amount of muscle tension. All right, this stuff is definitely review. So body planes, so remember there's three cardinal planes of the body. Sagittal plane there divides the body into left and right halves. Frontal plane divides the body into front and back. It's also known as the coronal plane. Um, so if you ever see that terminology, coronal plane and frontal plane are the same thing. And then the transverse or horizontal plane divides the body into top and bottom. Remember that movement in planes um, the movement is bisected by or cut in half throughout the entire range of motion. So for example, sticking with our uh, cardinal sagittal plane there, if that lady uh, were to look down, so she brings her chin to her chest, which is cervical spine or neck flexion, those bones, the cervical bones, are going to be cut in half, left and right, um, throughout the entire range of motion. And so flexion of the neck occurs in the sagittal plane. And generally speaking, flexion in most joints, flexion and extension in most joints of the body occur in the sagittal plane. So for example, glenohumeral flexion, elbow flexion, hip flexion, knee flexion, all those are in the sagittal plane. So moving forwards and backwards. Frontal plane motion is broadly speaking side to side. Um, and broadly speaking also, it is ABA deduction. So for example, if she were to abduct her hip, so if she brings her legs straight out to the side, uh, that, that frontal plane 
pictured now, is going to divide her femur in half, front and back, throughout the entire range of motion. And so all of that, or that particular ABA deduction motion occurs in the frontal plane. We also get um, shoulder abduction occurs in the frontal plane. Um, what else? Side bending, so lateral flexion of the trunk happens in the frontal plane. Extension of the thumb happens in the frontal plane. Abduction of the fingers, same thing. So primarily frontal plane, side to side motion, ABA deduction. Transverse or horizontal plane is rotary motion. So that's going to, again, divide things into top and bottom. Um, and so, for example, we'll pretend that this, um, eh, we'll move it down a little bit. So we're going to pretend it runs through her actual hip joint, so the acetabular femoral joint. If she were to internally and externally rotate her hip, so that means, again, to take the front of the femur, rotate it toward the midline is internal rotation, take the front of your femur, rotate it away from the midline, that's external rotation, and so that motion is going to be cut in half throughout its range by the transverse or horizontal plane. So most of your rotary motions, so hip internal external rotation, knee internal external rotation, uh, trunk right and left rotation, uh, shoulder um, internal external rotation, supination, pronation of the forearm, all of those occur in the transverse or horizontal plane. All right, so let's talk about strength and power. So strength is the ability to exert force. And then work, um, so the definition of work there, work is the product of force exerted on an object and the distance the object moves in the direction in which the force is exerted. So you, you apply a force to an object, you push on something, and then because of your push, it's gonna move a certain distance, and so, based on the amount of force you've applied and how far it moved, we can calculate how much work was performed. Um, sometimes you'll see discussions of work, so if we, um, people talk about something like bench press. So if you, you know, doing the bench press, you take the, the barbell out of the rack, bring it down to your chest, and then bring it back up. And so it, it's actually, um, undergone no net motion, so sometimes people will kind of joke about that being no work, because you ended up, you started and stopped in the same place. Um, but of course that's not true, there's, there's the negative work, so you uh, bring the bar down to your chest and resisting that motion, and then there's the positive component of it, which is you lifting it up. Power, um, typically in, from a strength and conditioning standpoint, when we talk about power, we're talking about explosive strengths. When we talk about movements that are powerful, we're talking about things that are either fast or intended to be fast. So things like the Olympic lifts, where you do like the snatch and you throw it pretty much straight overhead, right? That's a really powerful movement. Um, you lift, you know, maybe more than 100 pounds if you're reasonably strong. Um, not super strong, but reasonably strong. You lift maybe more than 100 pounds straight up over your head. Um, that's a lot of force and a little bit of time. And so that uh, is something that's understood as a, a powerful or explosive movement. So power then is the rate of doing work. So um, we're exerting a force against an object, causing it to move, but we're considering how fast it moved, right? So if we think about something like a squat, a slow squat, so you, you know, go all the way down, takes two or three seconds to go down, and then takes another three seconds to come back up, as opposed to if you do it in, let's say, three and a half seconds, so give or take half the time, um, that second movement is more powerful because you've done the same amount of work, lifted the same weight up and down, but in a shorter amount of time. So that's a more powerful motion. All right. Um, these are concepts you're probably pretty familiar with. So angular displacement, um, you can see that is the angle through which an object rotates. So my points here, so my A is the axis, obviously. And then we've got point B on this, we'll call this a lever, and then point C out here. And so both points B and point C have gone through the same angular distance. We're going to call that a, let's call that a 45 degree angle. So both of them have moved the same angular distance. Both of them have moved 45 degrees. So their angular displacement is 45 degrees. Angular velocity is the rotational speed. Um, and so we're going to include a time component there. So how, how far did it move and how fast did it move? So velocity is, is where we're going to include a time component. And then angular versus linear velocity. So we just said that the angular displacement here was 45 degrees for both of these, but 
the linear distance, so if we think about a portion of a circumference of a circle, the linear distance that B has moved is not nearly as far as the linear distance that C has moved. And so C, because it has moved a greater linear distance in the same amount of time, right, because the whole lever moved together, because C has moved a greater linear distance in the same amount of time, C is considered to be traveling faster. So, so C has a greater linear velocity. They both have the same angular velocity. They both went 45 degrees in, let's say, one second. But C covered, let's say, two feet in one second in terms of linear distance, and B covered, let's say, one foot in that same amount of time. And so C then is considered to be traveling faster. So where do we see that? Um, you see that in terms of things like lacrosse, right? So in lacrosse, I don't know how familiar you are with that. I've become familiar with it over the last uh, couple of years. Um, so the midfielders and the attack have fairly short sticks because they need to be able to do really quick uh, motions and really quick passes. The defensive players have really long sticks, so deep holes. Um, and the defensive sticks are much longer than the uh, sticks used by the attack or the midfielders. So part of the reason that the defenders have longer sticks is because you can use your stick, you can reach out and smack guys with it, right? Um, so it gives them, gives them greater range of motion for them to play defense. But the other thing is that because they've got this longer stick, uh, whenever they throw the ball, they can throw it a lot farther because it is going to be, uh, the ball itself is going to be farther from the axis of rotation, so it's going to travel a greater linear distance in the same amount of time. So you can throw a ball a lot farther with that longer stick. But you're not going to be able to do really quick motions with it, or if you do, you're going to have to choke up on it, um, kind of bring it in here and effectively make it more like an attack stick. All right, so I touched on this a minute ago. Um, so strength versus power. So exerting force at high versus low velocities. So power lifting, uh, the three competitive lifts in power lifting are squat, bench, and deadlift. And so um, here's a power lifter squatting over here on the left. The name of power lifting is, is a misnomer. It's kind of misnamed because the lifts are per performed pretty slowly in most cases. So it takes several seconds in order to perform a squat. As opposed to the Olympic weight lifts, so in, in this case, this athlete is doing a snatch, um, those are pretty fast. So they're applying less force because they're not lifting as much weight, but they're applying that force much more quickly, right? And so weightlifting, um, the Olympic lifts are considered to be the more powerful of the lifts despite the name of powerlifting. Um, and then there's an example in the textbook about a football offensive lineman who um, is, let's say, trying to push against a really big defensive lineman who weighs 300 plus pounds. So even though he's exerting a lot of force, he's probably exerting it fairly slowly because the opponent probably isn't moving very much. So generating a lot of strength, but not necessarily a lot of power in terms of not really moving very quickly. As opposed to badminton, the uh, birdie is, is fairly small and light, weighs only a few ounces, and so it's pretty easy to overcome that resistance. Um, and generate quite a bit of power in a badminton serve, for example. All right, so biomechanical factors and strength. We actually covered all these in 201 in the muscle lecture, but we'll do them again. Um, so manifest, so in terms of maximal strength, so think, think about the uh, power lifter on the previous slide who was squatting a lot of weight. Um, so what? What makes a person stronger? What determines their ultimate strength, right? What makes them a really good squatter? Um, so one aspect of that is neural control. So you have to be able to recruit the appropriate muscles. You have to recruit the appropriate muscles at the correct time. But moreover, you have to um, engage all your motor units. So remember, motor unit recruitment deals with, do we recruit small motor units or large motor units, or do we recruit all of them at the same time? So in order to exert maximal force, you have to be able to recruit all the motor units simultaneously. And then rate coding deals with how many times per second the alpha motor neuron, so the nerve that is attached to those muscle cells, how many times per second it sends electrical signals. The faster or the more times per second it sends those signals, the greater the frequency of the signals, the um, greater the intensity of the contraction. Because again, if the alpha motor neuron is constantly depolarizing. It's constantly releasing acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is constantly staying attached to the muscle cell, letting sodium come inside. The inside of the muscle cell, inside of the muscle cell, basically stays positive, which means that calcium stays out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. 
bound to troponin C. And so as a consequence of all of those cascade of events, the binding sites on actin stay exposed, and as long as myosin sees those, and as long as ATP is available, myosin is going to keep grabbing those binding sites and trying to pull them toward the midline, right? And so the faster or the more frequently we get those electrical signals, the depolarizations from the alpha motor neuron, the uh, greater the strength of muscle contraction. So that's rate coding. Another factor is muscle cross-sectional area. Um, so all of my physiology professors and anatomy professors in undergrad said this all the time. All else being equal, a larger muscle is a stronger muscle. All else being equal, uh, meaning things like uh, length of the, of the lever arm or the moment arm, um, the ability from a neural control standpoint, if everything else is equal, the differentiator is muscle size. And so why is that? Well, if you lift weights or resistance train, um, then what you're going to get with chronic resistance training, so you know, longer than four weeks, um, you're going to get a larger muscle, right? So how a muscle grows is that you add additional actin and myosin. And so when you add more actin, more myosin, remember those are the contractile proteins, or the contractile filaments. So if we add more of those, then the individual myofibrils grow. So the, the, um, the little columns inside of the muscle cell with the contractile proteins, those increase in diameter, those grow. And so with more actin, more myosin, we can generate more cross bridges. If we can generate more cross bridges, the muscle can generate more tension. So um, a larger muscle simply has more contractile proteins. Now, there are some slight differences in the way that, ways that muscle grows. Uh, and again, we touched on this in 201, but if you do really high volume type stuff, so you know sets of 15 and 20, and you do lots and lots of sets, the muscle will grow. But one of the primary ways that it grows is by adding uh, additional sarcoplasm, which is the cytoplasm of a muscle cell. So the muscle cell grows, but it hasn't really added very many additional contractile proteins as opposed to if you do heavier weight training, so let's say sets of five to eight, then the muscle cell grows slightly differently. You don't see quite as much of an expansion of the sarcoplasm, but you see more addition of actin, more myosin, and so more contractile proteins equals a stronger muscle. So those higher intensity um, sets, so again, that five to eight rep range, tend to result in a little bit different hypertrophy, that myofibrillar hypertrophy, than what we see with really high volume type stuff. Other things that affect the production of strength, so the architecture of the muscle itself. So in saying the architecture of the muscle, what I'm referring to is the orientation between the tendon of the muscle and then its muscle fibers. So do its muscle fibers run in a straight line in parallel with the tendons on either end? If so, that's a fusiform muscle. Or do they run at an angle to the tendon? Um, and so that's a, that's a pinnate muscle. So for example, here, so here's our fusiform muscle. So the muscles run from one end of the, or one tendon to the other, right? And so they run in parallel to it. So there's your fusiform muscle. And so biceps brachii would, would count as a fusiform muscle. As opposed to a pinnate muscle, so we've got our unipinnate muscle here, which so you can see the tendon. And so then the fibers run off at an angle from the tendon. So unipinnate muscles tend to be capable of exerting more force than fusiform muscles. And so the reason for that uh, is that you can pack more muscle fibers, more muscle cells in a smaller space, um, and then they have to act over a smaller range of motion. And so pinnate muscles are uh, able to generate more force, and with training, it changes their angle of pinnation. So as those muscle cells grow, that actually increases their angle of pinnation. Other things, so muscle length, so if muscles shorten by myosin attaching to actin and pulling it toward the midline, well, at certain points in the range of motion, myosin is going to have a good ability to do that, and at other points in the range of motion, less so, right? And so that's called the length tension curve. And so what we've got here, this depiction, we'll start in the middle. So the red, as always, is myosin. These are the little myosin heads. And then the blue, that's our actin. And so this is our, our muscle at resting length. So, you know, with your arm just by your side, for example. And so you've got good overlap of actin and myosin here, lots of spaces to grab. If we go toward the right, what we're doing then is we're stretching the muscle. So if you were to um, 
to use biceps as an example, if you were to fully straighten the elbow or have somebody do this passively for you, they fully straighten the elbow and then they bring your arm into shoulder extension. That's gonna really stretch the biceps muscle and in doing that, what happens is as you pull the tendons farther from each other or the insertion farther from the origin, you're gonna pull the sarcomeres apart a little bit, right? And so now we've pulled actin away from the myosin. And so if we ask somebody to exert maximal force in the biceps with their arm all the way behind them with their elbow fully, fully straightened or fully extended, they're not gonna be able to generate very much tension in the biceps. And the physical reason for that is because as we stretch the muscle and we stretch the sarcomeres, there simply aren't very many spots where myosin can attach to the actin, right? So there's only a couple of spots where myosin can grab on. So we don't get as many cross bridges. If we don't get as many cross bridges, we don't get as much muscle tension. <clears throat> so muscle that's fully lengthened can't generate very much tension. Conversely, if we fully shorten the muscle, so with biceps, if we fully you know, passively flex the elbow and then fully passively flex the shoulder, that's as short as biceps is gonna be able to be. And so when we do that, we actually have too much overlap of actin and myosin. So when myosin tries to grab actin and, pulls it toward, and tries to pull it toward the midline, it can't go anywhere. And so the myosin heads just kind of spin their wheels and they don't generate very much tension either. So from an applied standpoint then, a muscle that's fully lengthened or a muscle that's fully shortened can't generate very much tension. The sweet spot in terms of a muscle being able to generate tension is kind of right in the middle of its range of motion where myosin can attach to, to um, as many binding sites on actin as possible, but there's not overlap, they're not bumping up against the Z lines or myosin is not bumping up against the Z lines. Another thing that affects its joint angle. Um, so this is related to the moment arm. So as we move the elbow into extension, I know you can't see the hand, but again, the moment arm is that perpendicular distance, so the, the weight being lifted is not very long here, or the, the moment arm of the weight being lifted is not very long. And then as we flex the elbow a little bit, that moment arm increases all the way out to 90 degrees here. And so again, the farther something is from the axis of rotation, the more torque or turning force it exerts, and so the harder it's gonna to be to lift. Other things that affect it, so muscle contraction velocity. So this is called a force velocity curve, and you've already seen it at least once. So um, what we've got here on the y-axis is the amount of force generated by a muscle. On the x-axis, how fast it, that muscle is shortening. So you'll see then that if we are shortening really fast, the muscle is not generating very much force. So this is really explosive movements, things like a baseball pitch. Uh, and then if we're over here, this is actually an isometric contraction, so we're gonna go over just a hair. Um, we're generating lots and lots of force, but we're not moving very quickly. So if you think about somebody um, doing a maximal bench press, right? So if they're lifting as much weight as they possibly can, the bar's moving, but it's not moving very fast. So they're generating lots and lots of force, but the velocity is almost zero. And then if they get stuck, usually right in the middle on a bench press, um, then that is an isometric contraction. So you're not, there's no more um, acceleration. The bar is just staying put. So that's your isometric contraction. So why is that? Why is it that if, if I'm moving really fast, like in a baseball pitch, I can't generate very much force versus if I'm moving slowly, I can. Um, and then the answer to that deals with the capacity of muscle fibers themselves. So remember that um, you've got two broad categories of muscle fibers, fast twitch and slow twitch, and then you have some subcategories. So there's typically books talk about three subcategories. There are more, um, but typically books talk about three subcategories, and that's what you need to know for the NSCA. And so remember with our type 2X, the fastest of the fast twitch, they can generate 50 grams of force in less than 50 milliseconds, as opposed to our slow twitch over here, they can generate about 100, um, sorry, they can generate five grams of force, so, Fast twitch again, generate 10 times more, uh, or the type 2Xs generate 10 times more, and then they, it takes them 100 milliseconds, so more than double the time to do that. So basically, these two Xs are so fast, they're the only ones acting over here, and then as we slow down, the two As can catch up, as we kind of get in the middle here, and then the type 1s catch up, and so over here, when we're moving really slowly, we're engaging all of the muscle fibers because they've all had a chance to catch up. If we move too fast, so we do something super explosive, we're only recruiting the type two Xs because we're trying to move as fast as possible. Conversely, just as, as an aside, if you don't ever move fast and you don't ever lift really heavy weights, you never recruit the two Xs.
Um, so in order to recruit them, to train them, you got to lift heavy or you got to move fast, preferably both. I think there might be a question about this, so I'll address it. Uh, so this is the same curve you just saw. Um, again, the y-axis is the, um, the line of isometric contraction. And then if we move to the left of the y-axis, you'll notice that force continues to go up. But what's happening here is that uh, this is actually an eccentric contraction. So the, the muscle is, rather than shortening on the right side, it's actually lengthening on the left side. And so uh, to use, go back to the bench press example, if somebody takes the bar out of the rack and they lower it slowly to their chest, that's an eccentric contraction. And so what they're doing is they are contracting but lengthening triceps, contracting but lengthening pec major, anterior delt. Um, and so in doing that, you can lower a really heavy weight to your chest, or you can lower more weight to your chest under control than you can ever lift off of your chest. So you're stronger in an eccentric contraction than you are in a concentric. Why is that? Because in an eccentric contraction, you're also able to get an assist uh, from the connective tissue. So throwing it back to chapter one, um, you get help from the epiperiendomyceum, so the layers of fascia in a muscle. Um, that's the primary reason. And then if you do it really, if you do it faster, um, you're going to also generate a stretch reflex. But the primary reason is that uh, as you lengthen the muscle, the fascia also has an elastic property. So it's able to deform and return back to its original shape. And so then that augments or assists the contractile component. Um, we talked about muscle action types previously. So remember, a concentric muscle action is where the muscle contracts and shortens. Eccentric is where the muscle contracts but lengthens, as we just talked about. And then isometric is where the muscle contracts, but there's no change in length. So um, isometric contractions could be stabilizing contractions. So like um, the synergistic role that I discussed for multifidus at the beginning today. Or it could be um, that you get stuck in the middle of a maximal lift, like on bench press. Um, that would also be an, an isometric contraction. In terms of strength to mass ratios, um, so how strong are you per unit of body weight? Um, so that's going to be important, particularly for change of direction. Athletes who have a higher strength to mass ratio, who can control their body weight well, are really good at changing direction. Versus your athletes who are weaker, uh, it's going to be harder for them to, you know, fake somebody out or to stick their foot in the ground and then go from right to left. So higher strength to weight ratios are going to be really important, or strength to mass ratios are going to be really important for changing direction in our athletes, and also then for preventing injuries in our athletes. So one of the guys with the highest strength to mass ratios that I'm aware of is a guy named Lamar Gant, pictured there. So Lamar Gant uh, was the first guy to deadlift five times body weight. He lifted 661 at 132 pounds. Um, I think back in the mid 80s is when that happened. Uh, but a really, really impressive power lifter. Uh, other things. Um, so in terms of sources of resistance to muscle contraction, so gravity. Um, so usually you're having to resist gravity, not always, but, but a lot of times you're having to you know, lift a weight against gravity. So if you're doing most of your barbell lifts, so things like bench press, deadlifts, squats, etc., cetera, um, you're moving the weight against gravity. Um, gravity always acts down. And so you know, if you're doing something like, let's say you're holding a 10 pound weight out at arm's length, um, you know, so the, or you're pressing out the arm's length, so you, you kind of have to act in two ways there. Um, so you're pressing it out, but you're also having to resist that rotary force of gravity pulling it down. One of the things with machines, because um, the book touches on this a little bit, is that um, weight stack machines tend to have a cam on them, which is this thing. That's the cam. Um, and the cams tend to be kind of this shape. So the first machine to do this was, was a Nautilus machine. It was invented by a guy named Arthur Jones back in the late 60s. And then they really became popular in the 70s. The original, all the Nautilus machines, the originals were blue. And so the very original Nautilus machine um, was referred to as the Big Blue Monster. But the idea behind the Nautilus machines was that because of this oddly shaped cam and then the resistance from the chain, basically that uh, the resistance would change throughout your range of motion because as mentioned when I was talking about length tension curves earlier, muscles aren't equally strong throughout the range of motion. The two primary factors that affect that are the muscle's own length tension curve. The, muscle's really, the muscle itself is really strong mid-range, but that 
uh, length tension curve interacts with the length of the moment arm. So in the case of the biceps, biceps is strongest right at about 90 degrees, but the moment arm of the weight is also strongest, or also not strongest, the moment arm of the weight is uh, longest at 90 degrees as well, so it's providing the most resistance. And so those two kind of counteract each other. And so the idea there is that we should challenge a muscle a little bit less at the beginning of its range of motion, maximally challenge it through the middle, and then challenge it a little bit less at the top. That was kind of the idea behind the weight stack machine. And so you'll see here, this one has a similar um, sort of elliptical cam here. And so when this guy's arm is straight down, the chain is coming off the cam right here. And so the moment arm is fairly short, so we're not uh, generating as much resistance here at the beginning of the motion. But when we, or when he flexes his elbow, the cam is going to rotate up this way, and then the moment arm lengthens as the cam rotates, and so we have more resistance farther from the axis of rotation. We increase the torque exerted by the weight, and so that's going to make the weight harder through the mid-range, and then obviously as he continues to progress up here into elbow flexion, the cam is going to rotate up this way, and so you're going to get the same basic configuration where the moment arm shortens again. And so Arthur Jones' big sales pitch for the Nautilus machines was that um, because they had this, this cam that was kind of shaped like a kidney bean, because they had this cam that they changed range of motion or they changed resistance throughout the range of motion, allowing the muscle to be maximally challenged throughout the range of motion. So his big thing was like one set of maximal exercise, and that would be all that it would take in order to um, reach maximal strength. So, so the early Nautilus programs, and there were whole gyms, um, that were Nautilus gyms, and so basically you ran through a circuit, you did one maximal set on each machine, and that was it. Um, but that, that was part of the pitch, was that he had designed a machine that was adapted to the combination of the length tension curve of the muscle and the moment arm of the resistance, and so by accommodating both of those things, or by addressing both of those things, he could maximize muscle resistance throughout the range of motion and make you maximally strong. Inertia. So inertia is the tendency to remain in a uniform state of motion or a uniform state of rest. I flipped them from the slide, but that's okay. So the idea there is that an object at rest stays at rest, an object in motion stays in motion. So um, one of the things, because um, a lot of you know that I'm um, fairly interested in strongman stuff, and so one of the, the interesting things, anytime you see a strongman contest, you know, there's always there are almost always a lot of pulling events. You're pulling a plane or a bus or a truck or something, right? And so the hardest part, and the announcers always say, the hardest part's getting it moving. You have to overcome the inertia of the truck. And then once it's moving, once you've overcome its inertia, it becomes a little bit easier. So the athletes have to generate the most force right at the beginning of that until that thing moves. Once they've overcome its inertia, its initial tendency to stay at rest, then it tends to stay in motion. Now, of course, it's gonna be slowed down by things like wind resistance, plays a pretty minimal role, but also friction, um, which is going to play more of a role because of the mass of that object. So um, we have to overcome things inertia in order to propel them. Um, and so that applies to things like acceleration and deceleration during lifts. So, you know, if you're doing something like a power clean, you have to generate a lot of force at the bottom of the lift to overcome the initial inertia of the weight. And then as you get the bar up to um, hopefully not shoulder height, hopefully you can drop it down a little bit earlier than that, but as you get the bar up and then flip your elbows underneath you and then flip your wrists into extension, you then have to decelerate the weight. So it, it's gonna persist in motion, so now you gotta slow it down. Um, and then underweight, overweight implements. So we sometimes can, can play with these things um, to have athletes do overspeed or underspeed training. So you can have an athlete um, you know, train with a heavier shot put than normal, for example, that way when they get back to the original shot put, it feels a little bit easier, or you see it sometimes uh, people will train with underweight objects in order to move a little bit faster. So for example, in, in uh, training for stick handling and ice hockey, a lot of times you'll see um, people use golf balls for some drills. Now the golf ball is a lot lighter, it's easier to move, but because it's lighter and easier to move, it moves faster. And so the idea is that it helps you get used to moving your hands faster than you're gonna have to during an actual game. Friction you're familiar with? So the resistance or resistive force encountered when one attempts to move an object while it's pressed against another object. And so these people pushing the sleds, the idea of the resistance of the sled is, is caused by the friction, right? And so as you increase the number of plates that sit on top 
of that sled that increases the friction, so it makes it harder for that thing to move or harder for you to move that thing. Fluid resistance, so a key thing to know here about fluid resistance is that fluid is not only water, but fluid is also air. So when we talk about somebody moving through the air like a runner, uh, or somebody moving through the water like a swimmer, both of those uh, individuals are having to fight against fluid forces, even though air is air. So there's two types of drag, surface drag, um, which is the drag along the entire surface of an object. Um, so for example, uh, if we're thinking about swimmers, one of the things that they'll do to minimize surface drag is to wear a swim cap because it minimizes your surface area so you don't have water you know, flowing through your hair. That, that increases your surface drag and so that's gonna slow you down as opposed to if you wear a swim cap, press that down, decrease your surface area, decrease your surface drag. Form drag is on either the leading or the tailing edge of the object or actually both. Um, so form drag deals with um, what, what is your leading edge going into the water, sticking with the swimming example. So here's my swimmer here. And so in doing that hand over hand action and trying to minimize the profile that's actually in contact with the water, he is trying to minimize his form drag, at least on the front end. And then form drag on the back is as you move through a fluid, it's gonna create turbulence once you've, you know, on the backside. Um, and so that turbulence then tends to kind of pull you backwards or suck you backwards. And so if you can kind of taper off the, the backside of you <laughs> or whatever truck you're driving, your bike, whatever, whatever it is that you're moving through the fluid, if you can kind of have a taper to that to, to minimize that turbulence on the back, you're trying to minimize form drag, and thus you minimize that uh, tendency to, to pull you backwards a little bit. Um, so you can see that next time you're on the highway, uh, you'll see some 18 wheelers have things, I think they're called trailer tails, where they're, they're those things that pop off the doors and they kind of angle in a little bit off the back of the truck. And the idea there is to, um, rather than just having that abrupt stop of the rectangle of the truck that's gonna generate lots and lots of turbulence to kind of smooth the flow of the air across the back of the truck to reduce turbulence to then hopefully help them improve their gas mileage. Other sources of resistance for muscle contraction other than fluid forces and gravity are elasticity. So some of the things that we use to challenge muscles include things like springs. Um, so sometimes like gripping apparatus will have springs in them. Uh, bands like the lady on the left is demonstrating. <clears throat> you can see bows. I don't know if you're familiar with the old bow flex, uh, but you can see those sometimes and then rods. Um, so with the, any of those things, the greater the stretch, the greater the resistance. And so one of the problems with them is that they don't exert very much tension at the beginning and a lot of tension at the end, which is not in keeping with what we talked about with length tension curves. So it's good from a, a length tension curve standpoint that they don't generate very much tension at the, at the beginning, but it's not necessarily great that they exert their most tension at the end when the muscle's a little bit weaker. <clears throat> so ideally they'd exert the most force in the middle. One of the things that this book talks about uh, in terms of bands that is fairly common is the apparatus there on your right. You'll see athletes jumping up uh, with elastic bands attached to them. And one of the problems with that is when you're at the bottom of that and you're getting ready to initiate the jump, there's a bunch of slack in the bands. So when you're actually generating the force, the bands aren't fighting against you. You're still just propelling your own body weight. And then as you jump up, the bands increase tension and they basically you know, pull you back down to the ground. And so then that can increase the risk of injury from those bands pulling you back down to the ground. What it effectively does is it increases the eccentric component, the muscle contraction, but lengthening component when you hit the ground. Um, and so if that's what you're looking for, if you're trying to maximize eccentric components to help the athlete get better at absorbing their own body weight, they're useful for that. Um, but they're not, again, <clears throat> one of the things the authors stress is that the bands themselves don't exert any tension at the beginning of the movement, so they're not probably the best at helping increase vertical jump. Injury things. Uh, so one of the things with the back, um, you know, I'll try not to belabor this because I know I've been going for a while now, um, but one of the things with the back, so the back stabilizers, the spine stabilizers, sit really close to the vertebral muscles, and so, or, not muscles, the vertebral bones, the spine bones. Um, and so because they sit, because those stabilizing muscles sit really close to the bones, they don't exert much of a rotary component. So they don't have a very good mechanical advantage. There's not a lot of vertical component to their line of pull. 
And so because there's not a lot of vertical component, they have to generate lots of force to exert um, or to cause a, a turning effect. Um, and so the result is that your spine stabilizers or your, your uh, agonists of, back mo of spine motion have to generate lots and lots of force, which then produces really big compressive loads on the spine um, on top of whatever compressive load you're generating if you're doing something like you know, deadlifting or squatting, the weight itself already generates a pretty good compressive load on the spine. So um, one of the questions, I don't think it's a great question, but one of the questions in the bank um, for this first quiz is the location or most common location of um, disc herniations. Sorry, I had to take a phone call there. Uh, so the two, uh, the two discs most likely to rupture are L4, L5, and L5, S1. What's that mean? So uh, when we talk about discs, so here's one vertebrae, here's a second vertebrae, and then there's the intervertebral disc. And so discs are named for the vertebrae that they sit between. So L4, L5 sits between the fourth lumbar vertebrae, so the fourth one down, or from the top, right? So it sits between the fourth lumbar vertebrae and the fifth lumbar vertebrae. So that disc is second most likely to rupture, and then the most likely disc to rupture is L5, S1. And so that's between the lowest lumbar vertebrae, L5, and then the top of your sacrum. So the first sacral vertebrae is S1. Um, and the reason for that, which you won't need to know, but the reason for that is because of that lordotic, that anterior curvature of the lumbar spine. There's a lot of shear force um, that those discs have to absorb. All right, so that's the back. Uh, intra-abdominal pressure. So this lifter is doing that. Um, so intra-abdominal pressure is pressure inside the abdomen. And so usually before big lifts, whether it is something like a snatch, like this athlete is performing, or um, you know things like squat or deadlift, athletes will take a big deep breath in and hold it. And so the reason that you do that is you increase the intra-abdominal pressure. That helps stabilize the spine. And so it makes it less likely that you'll su sustain a back injury. Um, if you've ever lifted, you know, done heavy squats, done heavy deadlifts, um, you probably just do it, uh, just, just hold your breath, um, because you kind of unconsciously try to stabilize your spine that way. So um, the Valsalva maneuver is taking that big deep breath in and holding it. You're pushing air against a closed glottis. That keeps the air from escaping from your lungs, increases the pressure, makes your torso more rigid. It does decrease venous return though, so the blood coming back to the heart. If there's less blood coming back to the heart, there's less blood going out to the brain. And so after you do that Valsalva maneuver, after you take your big deep breath, hold it, and perform your lift, um, you may feel lightheaded, you may see stars, you may feel dizzy. Um, and the reasons for that are twofold. One, because of the increased blood pressure from the lift itself, but two, um, because of the decreased venous return, you get less blood flow to the brain or less oxygen to the brain. Um, and so because of that, that can cause that dizziness um, or that feeling of instability. And so there's, if you're bored, there's some pretty funny videos on YouTube of, um, I've always seen ones of power lifters that like start holding their breath way too early and they do the lift and like pass out during the lift. Um, so you got to be careful with it, but um, it is something that is really effective at stabilizing the spine. Um, and so I always did it when I was lifting competitively. I never had any problems, but um, some people don't, don't do it effectively and so can lose consciousness and it can be dangerous. Uh, what about lifting belts? So lifting belts help with this. So they, they increase pressure on top of what you're able to do through the Valsalva maneuver. Um, if you use lifting belts all the time though, there's the potential that you won't strengthen the trunk musculature that you need to stabilize the spine. And so if you happen to not use them, then uh, you may be more susceptible to a back injury because you haven't uh, strengthened the spinal stabilizers like you should have. So from a powerlifting standpoint, I know um, in my experience, we never really used belts until we were 80% or higher of our one rep max on any lifts. And sometimes it was even you know, more than 80% before we'd start using belts. And again, the idea being to, to get good at stabilizing the spine without the assistance of the belt. Shoulder stuff, um, things overhead can lead to impingement. And so we talked about impingement a lot in 201. Um, basically you close down this space underneath the acromion. And so usually where you impinge the biceps, uh, long-headed biceps tendon, the subacromial bursa, or the supraspinatus muscle in an overhead lift is because the scapula isn't moving right. So maybe it's because you kind of sit with your scapula is protracted too much, um, <clears throat> or 
that you have you know, tightness of pec minor, some of the scapular downward rotators, and so that limits your scapular range of motion. So if somebody doesn't have good scapular range of motion, if they're not really able to, to uh, upward rotate it very effectively, then they can get impingement with overhead lifts and they can get pain with, with overhead lifts as well. <clears throat> the knees, um, <clears throat> usually li related to lifting, um, the patella is the most susceptible to injury, so your kneecap, and especially if you're doing um, you know, deeper squats, but especially squats where you also use knee wraps like this power lifter has on, um, those knee wraps make it hard to flex the knee, so they, they help you lift more weight, um, and they help stabilize the knee some, but, but one of the other things they do is they really add to that compressive load of the patella. They're really seated against the femur, and so they um, increase the wear and tear on the underside of the patella. They wear down the cartilage faster, and so um, that can be a little problematic for some athletes. And then in terms of lifting, in some of the overhead lifts, um, so like this athlete's at the bottom of a clean and getting ready to do a jerk, um, you can see that there's pretty significant hyperextension of the wrists, and so sometimes that can be problems um, or can be a problem. And then overhead lifts, um, that puts a lot of weight through the humeral ulnar joint, and so sometimes you'll see athletes have elbow problems or elbow pain lifting overhead because of that compressive load on the elbow when you lift overhead. And that is it for chapter two. So then next time we'll move on to chapter three. We'll see you then.